Welcome back to the Sunshine Teachers Training Prepared Environment and today we are going to be exploring the sensorial area, learning what we need to know when we set it up, how to make sure that you know the children are learning effectively and what we can do at home if we don't have so many materials or so much space. So sit back and enjoy. Just like in all areas of the classroom, order is imperative and I talked a lot about this when we discussed the practical life materials. I'm going to link that over here so you can watch that as well and I don't have to repeat the same thing all over again. But again, there is a sense of order here whereby we have the easiest material here and it gets progressively more difficult till we have the most difficult over there which is the trinomial cube. These materials are for the two and a half year old and the final material is for the five to five and a half year old child. Apart from being orderly in terms of age getting progressively more difficult, um, they are also grouped uh, as per the senses. We are in the sensorial area and the materials are here to help the children refine their senses which are visual, tactile, smell, taste, touch, and then we have some geometry and algebra. So we have the visual materials here, okay, followed by the tactile materials. We come to smell, sound, and then we have our geometry, and finally algebra over there. So all of it is laid out according to the sense. They're grouped according to the senses that will be refined. Let's talk about some of the principles of these materials and it's important for you to understand the principles because if you are going to be creating alternative materials instead of buying them at home or variations if you are a teacher then you really need to understand these principles when you're creating the materials. So firstly we the, the principle is called isolation of quality and what we mean by that is that every material will teach one lesson. If with this material, the long rods, I'm supposed to learn length, that's it. It's not going to be confused with anything else because the lesson here is length. So when you look at these long rods, we have the smallest rod and it progressively gets longer till it's one meter. All the rods are one color. The only thing that's changing is the length. We could have easily had 10 different colors right but then let's say my child takes that material and they work with it and they've mastered I don't know what actually lesson they've taken away from it did they learn about color or did they learn about length right so we don't confuse it by mixing in too many lessons there's one lesson per material isolation of quality just like in practical life our materials are limited there is one of every material so that in a very, very natural way, children learn to share or they learn to cooperate and work on it together or take turns. So the materials themselves are helping the children to build the social skills that they need to cope in the big world around them. Another one of the principles is that the materials must have a control of error and again this goes all through the classroom okay now the control of error means that when there is a mistake the child is able to recognize that for themselves we have done a beautiful video on the control of error i will link it right here and i will also put it in the, the link in the description box below so that you can access it and watch more about that now when we are in visual training, if the child makes a mistake, they will be able to see their mistake. When we are in tactile training, if the child makes a mistake, they will be able to feel their mistake or hear their mistake or smell when they've made a mistake, all right? That would be the control of error. So you also have to keep that in mind when you're creating variations or you're creating uh, you know, extensions. You've got to make sure that there is an inbuilt control of error so that the child doesn't depend on you to correct them. As you can see, our materials are very beautiful and well-maintained. 
that's important because we want the children to be attracted to the material they are the central focus of this classroom so you've also got to make sure that whatever you make whatever you create will be beautiful and attractive to the children now what is your role as the Montessori guide in terms of the sensorial material for one you've really got to be thorough with your presentations with the sensorial material there are very specific ways that we hold the material there are very specific ways that we carry them there are very very specific steps to how we present this material so that the learning goes deep so that the concept that lies within this material gets internalized for the child so that's really important for you all right um, you've got to the, these presentations are done in silence so it's important for the teacher to later on follow up these presentations with what we call a three period lesson now if you don't already know what a three period lesson is again we have some great videos on that I will link it for you and put it in the description box so that you can watch the video and when we do this three period lesson the children will be able to learn and enrich their vocabulary with words like long and short, broad and narrow, big and small, loud and soft. It, you know, really, really gives them a wide range of vocabulary. Another one of our responsibilities is to nurture creativity through the materials. A lot of people have this misconception that Montessori does not encourage creativity. I cannot even begin to explain to you the ways that I have seen children use the sensorial material. I've been in this field for 20 years. Until today, I will see children build some kind of a stru structure combining these materials that I've never seen before in a way that I couldn't even imagine that they would do. And when they do this, it's mind blowing. It's so beautiful. Many teachers have this, um, you know, this feeling that if I presented the, the tower to be built this way, that's the only way the material can be used. No way. How are we ch teaching children to be innovative or to think out of the box if we tell them there's only one way to build the pink tower? We've got to allow them to explore, to combine the materials, to create. They have so many ideas and they want to exercise, you know, those the, the things that they have in their minds they want to put it out there but if we're not there you know nurturing that and encouraging encouraging them to do that it's not going to happen if we're going to be that strict person that no you can't use the material this way put it back and you can only use it the way I showed you that's not true of Montessori they can combine two three four materials build structures that they have envisioned in their minds as long as they are not being harmful to the material, the environment, or their friends, and they return the material the way they found it. Those are the things that we have to maintain, and they, they are able to use it the way they want. I've seen children build little structures with, you know, maybe a fence, and they may take the animals from the culture and put them inside, and then they'll make the animals have conversations with each other. And some teachers feel that, no, how can they be doing that? They shouldn't be combining materials from different areas. It's fine as long as they return it and they are being respectful with, with the material. It shouldn't be a problem at all. Keep in mind that some children, you know, it doesn't come to them immediately to create something new or to be a bit uh, adventurous with the material. And in that case, as a teacher, as a Montessori guide, you can, you know, kind of bring it out in them and suggest to them, hey, do you think you can uh, make a Christmas tree using these materials? Do you think you can combine the pink tower and the broad stair? What can you make and show me something new? Kind of edge them towards it and then they will take off on their own. So be aware of those children. Don't let them get left behind and get them into also being creative and uh, inventive with the material. Another misconception about Montessori is that it doesn't in encourage socialization because children are working on their own. It's individual work with a piece of material. But that's not true. They can take any of these materials and work together. They can collaborate on a project together 
And supposing you do have a child in your classroom who's a little bit shy, who's a little bit introverted, you can pair them with somebody who's more outgoing or a couple of children who are more outgoing and tell them, hey, why don't you use these materials together and let's see how you build it. So in this way, you're helping them to get over that and make friends and to socialize and learn social skills along the way. Keep in mind, you do not have to force the shy child into socializing. We offer them the opportunity, but we are not going to insist that they have to do it. At the end of the day, it's their choice. If they want to work alone or they want to work together, but just show them that the possibilities are there. When you do the course with us, the diploma course, we teach you how to make a lot of the materials. And so, you know, a lot of uh, parents uh, are, e are able to create materials uh, for their children without having to buy them. Now we all know Montessori materials are definitely expensive and they are an investment. Apart from that, sometimes you have just one child and you think to yourself, well, you know, if I buy this, what will I do afterwards? Where will I store it? I'm not going to use it. So you really don't want to make that investment and you'd rather find an alternative. And that is so possible. Many people feel, how can I do that, you know? What you have to do is look for the concept that's being taught in the material. Let's come back to the long rods. The concept being taught here is length. Now, what can I make that's going to teach my child about length? Can I collect some empty tissue rolls and, you know, stick them together to make these rods. Maybe I don't have to make them this big if I don't have that much space in my home. I can make them, you know, uh, relatively shorter but still proportional, proportionate to each other. So we look for the concept behind the material, all right? Uh, when we are learning about size, we can get boxes. We don't have to get 10, we can get maybe 5 and let them arrange it from biggest to smallest. So always look behind and see what is the concept being taught over here. Is it about tactile? Then I can get sandpaper and mount it on buffalo paper or cardboard and let them match the textures. I can cut fabric and let them feel and match the fabrics. Everything, there's always a way behind it. Let's think back to when she started her first school, Dr. Maria Montessori. She must have had a shoestring budget as well. She started in a very, very um, low income area. She didn't have a lot of money to invest. So I'm pretty sure her materials were also very, very simple and they got modified along the way. So we as well at home can find ways to give our children the experiences in affordable and manageable ways. We have a lot of videos on sensorial material and within those materials, there are times we discuss how you can make the material at home or make an alternative. So do head over to our playlist called the Material Spotlight. I will link it here and put it in the description box. You can go through those and it'll give you some ideas of how you can incorporate sensorial experiences at home. Another thing a lot of teachers tell me is that, you know, they'll come and say, Jenny, my child has covered all the material now. I don't know what to do next. I've taught them everything. Now that's just not possible. Our mission is not to come into this classroom and present one material after another, after another, after another. Keep in mind, every material has an age. Again, when you do the Montessori Diploma with us, you get a handbook, you get a module that gives you all the lesson plans and every lesson plan has an age. So this is for a two and a half year old child. This is for a three year old child. These are for three and a half and so on. So we do not have to present it too early. I should not be presenting uh, an activity for a four year old child to a two and a half year old child. It may appear that they can physically do it, but the concept will not be internalized. The steps are more. The concentration required is much deeper, which that child will not have. So if I am working with just five or six materials for this child, that means I've got to have a lot of extensions and variations. When I'm with the pink tower, so now you know how to build it this way, okay? 
Maybe next time you can build it flat on the floor. Maybe we can scatter all the cubes in the environment and we will build it from a distance. Maybe we can build it wearing a blindfold. Maybe we can have base cards. We can draw, you know, trace the shapes and cut them and stick them on a big piece of chart paper. There are a lot of things that you can do, um, which we do teach in our courses, but the internet is also full of ideas of you know, how you can vary this material. Apart from varying, you want to extend it in your day-to-day -day life. How about we look for cubes when we go out into, you know, that we're going shopping or we're going to a restaurant. Show me how many cubes you can find. Can you find a prism? Can you match and find me the darkest shade of green? There are always ways that you can extend the knowledge that we get from the sensorial activities to outside of the shelf. Our learning must not stop at the shelf. Let me tell you a very funny story. Some years ago, I had taken one of my sons shopping and uh, I was buying a pair of shoes. And I went to one of these department stores that has all these shoes and they have grouped them by color, all right? So while I was waiting for my shoes and trying on for size, my son was in the area busying himself. And he comes to me after a few minutes, really excited. He goes, you gotta come and see this. You have to see this. So I said, what, what is it? And he drags me to one of the racks, the shoe shelves, and he says, look, I've graded all the red shoes from lightest to darkest. And he was so proud of himself. Now here's a little boy who's three and a half to four years and he's messed up the storekeeper's display. I should have been embarrassed, I could have been embarrassed, but for me, I was the proudest mama in the world. I thought, yes, Montessori works everywhere. My child is applying his knowledge in the big world outside us. That is exactly what you're supposed to be doing with this knowledge. And let me tell you something, he graded it perfectly. It was beautiful. I could have shouted it from the mountaintops. So take that knowledge, whatever it is, and extend it into your day-to-day -day activities. You're in a shop and the child is trying on clothes. You have to buy clothes for your child. Which one feels soft to you? Which one is feeling a bit rough? What do you think will feel nicer on your skin? You're giving them autonomy, which is leading to their independence, and you're combining sensorial skills. Isn't it wonderful? Another thing I know that has a lot of popularity is sensory bins. They have uh, come about in the recent years, you know, uh, bins with uh, rice or water beads or uh, foam and things like that. And the, you know, there will be objects hidden in there and the children can dig inside there and find and feel. And this is very, very satisfying to um, younger children, all right, say uh, below the ages of two and a half. So it's really nice to incorporate in your home or even to have as group activities. Uh, if you, you can see children when they use this, they're really enjoying that feel. It just goes to show you how important sensory education is. A lot of people question why does Montessori have a whole area dedicated to sensory education? Well, this is something that they need between the ages of two and six they are in the sensitive period of learning through their senses that means we have to give them experience experiences to satisfy that sensitivity of theirs if we don't it's going to affect them negatively later and we've done a video on this um, i'm going to link it here talking about sensitivity to learning through the, the importance of learning through your five senses and it also talks about what the adverse effects are if we don't expose them uh, to learning through their five senses. I'm sure you'll find it very helpful. Dr. Montessori's sensorial materials are just beautiful beyond imagination. Not only do they satisfy the needs of the child in terms of sensory education, but they prepare them and they give them that confidence so that when they leave this classroom or they leave their homes and they're out in the world, they become masters of that space. They understand things better. They can look at something and they can, you know, differentiate this is big and this is small, this is heavy and this is light, this is rough and this is smooth. Not, not just the, the vocabulary, but the concepts 
of understanding. We actually take the time to teach them something which in other schools they expect children to take for granted. I don't know about you but I remember I was working um, in a school one day and uh, the children had to learn about heavy and light and they had this workbook and there was a picture of a seesaw and on one end was an elephant and on one end was a mouse and the child had to circle which one they felt was light. Now if the child hasn't had an ex uh, experience of a seesaw or hasn't really seen an elephant or hasn't really felt heavy and light, is this going to make any sense to them? Isn't it better I actually put two objects in their own hands and I tell them, tell me which one is heavy and which one is light? Doesn't that become more meaningful? Isn't that experience going to last longer with them than something that's just in a picture and 2D? They may circle it with some encouragement, but is that going to stick with them? Remember something, and I've said this before in some of the videos that I've talked about, what the hand feels, the mind remembers. I keep saying this over and over again. Whatever we take in with our senses will last with us for a lifetime. And that is the, those are the kind of experiences that we want to give our children through the sensory materials. So even if you cannot buy all the materials, you can give them the experiences. You can have, whether it's in you know, a school that you're starting and you cannot invest in all the materials or you're doing this at home or you have a little daycare and there is some material you don't have but you want to give the child that experience, have a group activity. Give them items to feel this is hot and this is cold. Let them experience it sensorially and you will enrich their lives. I hope this has been helpful for you. As I've said before, I will be back with more. We're going to explore this entire prepared environment together. You're going to learn a lot, but you need to turn on your notifications and subscribe so you don't miss any of my videos. If you've enjoyed this, hit that like button. Show me some love. Until we meet again, have a beautiful day.